Good evening. Welcome to this arable catch up. How are you tracking? I'm Nick Clark, National Policy Manager at Federated Farmers. Tonight we'll be hearing from five incredibly knowledgeable and passionate leaders in the arable industry. First up, we'll hear from Colin Hurst, Federated Farmers Arable Chair and National Board Member, who will talk about what Feds is up to across five pressing arable issues. Then we have John McCaw, Chair of the Herbage Seed Subsection, and David Burkett, Feds Arable Industry Vice Chair. They will give an update on seeds issues. After them, we'll hear from Brian Ledley, Chair of the United Wheat Growers, who will talk about what's happening with wheat and grain. And then it will be our guest, Ivan Laurie, from the Foundation for Arable Research and Chair of the Arable Food Industry Council, who will talk about opportunities for the industry. There will then be time for questions and answers. Just a couple of housekeeping matters before we get underway. During the webinar, you can type questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. We'll do our best to answer these live during the Q&A part of the meeting. The webinar is being recorded and it will be placed on Federated Farmers website under events in a day or so. So with that, I'll hand over to Colin to kick things off. Oh, th thanks, Nick. Um, we can just have my, uh, there's my slide there. So yeah, plant variety rights. So this is something that Federated Farmers Arrow have been working on um, over the past few years. Um, I think my video is working. Uh, um, and, and we, and we um, submitted to um, the Environment Select Committee um, back last year, and we're just waiting for the second reading to come through the House. Uh, look, the, the biggest um, gain we've got is the ability to retain our own seed um, from one year to the next. So that's uh, an exemption within the, um, the new Act, and um, we look forward to that um, getting into place. I think the other thing is um, we there is an intention that we need to work with the seed companies on this and work out how we um, how we will um, compensate them with some sort of royalty regime. So but that's still a work in progress and um, we'll be working with the officials and the plant breeders. The other uh, next issue we've been working, uh, had a um, complaint into the Commerce Commission and in relation to what we perceive to be anti-competitive procurement practices um, with milling wheat. Um, and this, this has resulted um, from and, and anyone that knows about the wheat industry knows that um, essentially there was uh, three buyers of milling wheat and then two of the buyers were working together so um, effectively there's only two buyers going forward and we consider that to be anti-competitive and we've put a, um, a comprehensive complaint into the Commerce Commission and we've just followed up with that recently so the outcome is they're still determining um, whether there's a genuine complaint there they have interviewed um, uh, the grain and seed trade members, some of the grain and seed trade members, and also the um, and, and so those milling companies to um, get an understanding of uh, how that's all going on. The next big issue uh, for Federated Farms Arable and well, Federated Farms itself is biosecurity is one of the um, is the sixth biggest issue that Federated Farmers deal with, and it's my spokesperson role in relation to um, plants in the biosecurity space. Currently, we have two black grass incursions in in play. Um, one of them stems back from 2016, and that st is still popping up on farms. Um, and just recently, as early as mid-January, there was another detection in it related to that um, 2016 incursion. So a couple of farms still in play there. And then another recent one, just before Christmas, um, it was in a certified linseed crop, and there was uh, four farms uh, had, had sown that crop in, with at inspection time, but with a sure quality, they uh, discovered uh, black grass in one of them, and essentially those uh, paddocks were destroyed. Um, so that's a live incursion going on at the moment. Um, and it, in two ways, it in two there's two things. In one way, it's kind of good; it was found, but hugely disappointing. It got into the country, um, it managed to get through the border, but thank goodness we've got a, a very rigorous. Um, certification scheme and, and that was picked up through that process. Um, the other thing that we've got I've got going on is the seed and grain readiness is our GIA partner with uh, uh, with um, there's FAR, there's United Wheat Growers, uh, Grain and Seed Trade um, and the Flower Mothers Association um, are, the, are the partners in that seed and grain readiness response. So 
we have undertaken to apply to the um, MPI to get a biosecurity levy. So that's application has to go to cabinet. Um, but it's just been finalised uh, over the last few weeks and that application is going in. And that's the idea with that is to, if when there's a significant incursion that um, the, the, the grain and seed industry will help fund part of that MPI will basically underwrite it. But the intention is there has to be paid back and that, that operates under the current Borough Security Act. The other next thing that uh, federated farms have been dealing with in relation to arable matters is agrochemicals. So the Environmental Protection Authority called for more information on glyphosate and members would have received that uh, a survey that, um, well, we undertook a survey and, and we had 1,500 members participate in that. So that was a really comprehensive survey, understanding the practices of how glyphosate works. So we're still waiting to hear back with what the Environmental Protection Authority is going to get up to in, in, in relation to this. Um, but essentially it was a call for information and they're going to determine whether glyphosate needs to be placed under restriction. So we're really uh, watch that one really closely. The next thing we've been dealing with EPA is they've reached out to us just this week to have an understanding how seeds are treated and how they're um, dealt with in the in the in the farming community. Um, there's seeds treated, and this is with fungicides and insecticides uh, domestically, but there's also imported seeds, and there doesn't doesn't appear to be any regulations and um, how that all works. So good on EPA for looking into that. Um, it's all about um, preventing people getting uh, poisoned, I suppose, with some of these seeds, some of them are really poisonous and um, yeah, just all being good and safe and how that's dealt with. The other thing that sort of popped up just at the start of this year is WorkSafe have reached out to the industry. And this is a wee bit of a quirky sort of thing. Um, normally the officials would reach out to the industry to get a bit of a heads up, but this just popped off in their inbox. Um, so this is about restricted entries after a crop is sprayed and some of the proposed rules are quite sort of bizarre, really. This, that, that, so basically, after a crop is sprayed, um, they are saying there's only so many days, or there's a limit of how many days before you can re-enter that field, um, unless you've got safety equipment. But you know, some of the withholding periods are less than the proposed restricted entry. So it's one government part, department not necessarily talking to the other. So element of frustration. So we're, we're talking to them and trying to tidy it up. And just the last point, um, the Fire and Emergency New Zealand. So I, that's my spokesperson role as fire and it's really important for the arable sector to still undertake our stubble burning. So I know it's a, um, some people frown on it and, um, but it's a really good cultural practice, practice that we undertake, especially when we are uh, dealing with potential um, herbicide resistance types issues, it's a really important cultural practice that we still need to need to have in our stubble, I mean, in our, in our toolbox. Um, yeah, but anyway, that's that's a quick update from me. Um, yeah, just just uh, feel free to chip in with your questions. I'll hand over to John and David. Thank you very much, uh, Colin. Um, so yeah, we're just going to do a tag team thing here for the herbage seed side of things. Um, First of all, just a quick um, update on the SCIS, SCIS or the Seed and Certification Information System. Hopefully, uh, everybody has heard of this by now. Um, it's a major shakeup of how we um, run the certified seed system, um, and it is on track to be going live in uh, May. So, you, please, you can expect to enter your crops this year online. You'll be hearing a lot more about this in the next few weeks. Um, our current focus is a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Our current focus is to roll out training and support. So at the moment that is focused on bureau staff and it will move through merchants and field reps and then of course to farmers. So there'll be a range of different training methods employed. Uh, the other major focus is meeting the requirements of MPI in order to go live, which um, is quite a substantial body of work. Um, so I'll hand over to David to talk about the next point. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, a couple of things I'll just cover. First of all, I'll just cover um, of the harvest. So obviously we've had a very difficult harvest and, and very challenging for most growers. 
Um, and it looks like uh, you know, grass yields probably down between the 10 and 20%, and clover yields are probably down by 50%, we believe. So while that's been problematic for us, it actually means that you know, there are very short global supplies of those seeds now, in fact, of most of the seeds in which we produce. So uh, that does give us um, some good bargaining power going forward. So that's enough about the harvest. I think we'd all like to just put that one behind us. Uh, the next item there is just what's happened with the cost of production, um, particularly in the last uh, three or four months. Um, obviously the war in Ukraine, uh, COVID, are all contributing to significant increases in the costs and the way in which we operate. So as farmers, it's really important that when we're negotiating contracts, that we, we know the reasons why we wanna have the prices that we're asking for. And it's really important that you understand the true costs of what it means to grow your crop. And, and by that, I mean, not just uh, the cost of growing it in the paddock. Uh, quite often we look at gross margins um, of what it's cost to cultivate and, and herbicide and fungicide and, and fertilizer that paddock. But the true growing cost of that includes all of our farm operations. Um, so things like our repairs and maintenance, our rates, our insurance, um, vehicle expenses. And don't forget that you as a farmer need to get paid as well. That's part of the cost of running your business. So all of those costs add up and need to be taken into account when we're looking at the gross margin per hectare of these crops. And that's something that we've probably been guilty of. So when you are looking at those figures, um, make sure we add all those things up, divide it by the number of hectares, and that will give us a good argument as to why we were looking and asking for the prices that we we think we need to have in order to um, be sustainable with these contracts. Um, you know, it's something that we probably haven't been great at as, as the whole gross margin things, but when it comes to negotiation, that's gonna be a key point as to why we're actually asking for these prices. So have a good look at your, your costs, um, understand what they are. And quite often once you've got those whole of farm operating costs, um, it's simply a matter of dividing that up and putting it across each hectare that you're putting your, your crop across. Um, and the next thing we're going to talk about is, is contracts. Obviously, that's something that's um, hugely been in discussion lately. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is that if you have signed a contract, it's really important that we fulfill those contracts. It's very difficult for us to go back to companies and challenge them when they aren't behaving or fulfilling their contracts when we have growers who aren't doing the same at our end. So if you do have contracts, you know, that's the integrity of what we do as farmers is making sure that we um, abide by those contracts and fulfill them. So that's probably the, the first point I'd like to make. Um, and then the second one is, is, as we all know, you know, the contracts for herbage seeds are really quite plentiful at the moment. So we've got, you've got the opportunity to negotiate and work out what varieties suit you or work. Um, so, you know, have some time, think about what is the best for your farming situation. Um, and it's not a case of the first contract that comes up with drive as it was, you know, for the last uh, 10 or 20 years. John, have you got any comments on contracts? Uh, yeah, I think it, the, the key message, I suppose, is that it's not up to federated farmers to tell growers whether or not to sign a contract. That's uh, each individual is different. But just to reiterate what David said, that um, honour the sanctity of a contract. Um, a good faith negotiation, in my view, would be before that seed goes on the ground. After that, it's more of a hostage situation. Um, in terms of what we're doing about the current situation with uh, herbage seed pricing, um, we're running out of time to discuss it, but happy to discuss things one-on-one -on -one with anyone who would like to know more. But just briefly, Herbage Seed uh, have met, had discussions with the major seed companies. We are presenting at the GSTA conference in October, where we will present gross margins to the merchants to help them understand the reality on farm. We are undertaking a media campaign to raise awareness both within the industry and within the merchants to as to the issue and build a, an expectation of a significant increase in prices at least in 12 months time. And we are actively investigating options around supplementing Nui with potentially another Nui type common. So there's quite a lot of work going on in this space. We understand the pain. 
Okay, Thanks. so um, I think that, that wraps up Herbage. So we'll hand over to Brian to talk about grains. Okay, hey, uh, thanks very much, John and David. Uh, look, I guess starting with, again, uh, a bit of a summary on the harvest. Uh, we all know it's been a very tough affair. Um, yields have been back across most, if not all, growers. Uh, left people sitting feeling pretty vulnerable, but I guess the big issue is around quality, particularly on probably malting barley and, and milling wheat. Um, talking to the mills across the board, major issues with... Uh, low falling numbers, um, low test weights, hand kernel weights. They tell me screenings actually are okay, so they don't have a problem there. The only thing that's testing high in some instances is moisture. So the message is on that, do keep an eye out for uh, grain quality in your silos. If you do have high moisture, monitor it closely for both uh, mould sitting in there, but also bugs and contaminants do get it dried. If, if you've got a low yield, the last thing you want to do is jeopardise the quality of what you've got. Mills are working hard to uh, try and utilise it. The reality is, um, from the harvest, milling quality grain is very tight and is short. Uh, the mills probably will all be importing uh, into the South Island this year as growers. We just have to accept uh, consumer demand will be there and we want that kept so that we've got those markets into the future. Uh, the other one they did mention is samples have been somewhat slow coming in there, trying to really get a handle on it. I think if we've got grain that meets the market, we should get those samples submitted to uh, get the opportunity to market our product so that we don't lose it to import product unnecessarily. Um, so on that, I think probably we all know that uh, the harvest has been bad. There's no more I need to discuss there. Um, and to the, there are exceptions into those guys well, well done for getting good crops, but it uh, has been difficult. Um, the other one, and I guess it's following on a wee bit from David and John's talk, is around growing costs. Uh, we've seen some inflation on inputs for last harvest, but I think we're going to see considerably more. We hear of CPIs running at 6%, and we all look at our own costs and think that can't be so. Our own costs are considerably high, and we hear talk of... Uh, urea and ag chems potentially going up 20% looking forward. So again, it's the same as what David said, do your gross margins as accurately as you can and be fair to your business. Um, don't cut short, know the value of your product because uh, the outlook is pretty bright for grain. And if you're going to be partake in that, you need to know where is a comfortable position for you to market product. And if you don't know the values of your product, including your fixed costs for business costs, uh, it's very hard to make those decisions. Um, I guess um, for the grain supply and demand, I touched on a bit with uh, the milling sector. They are very short. I've also talked with uh, guys in the molten barley. They believe they will get through, but they are very, very tight. There will be no carryover product um, quality for them also is marginal, but they believe they're working with it and we'll get through. Um, but again, as with the mills and the malting industry, do talk to your buyers, regardless of where you're marketing, keep an open communication going. Um, there could be opportunities that you might have, particularly if you're fortunate to have free grain in there. Um, particularly the mills and potentially the malting are looking beyond what we would classify as the regular and consistent varieties for their markets. They are looking at other options um, that may well suit their, their end use and there could be opportunities there. So consider those carefully. Um, feed grains or with barley, uh, there's good demand. We're fortunate to have a strong dairy industry. Um, buyers are, are looking for and using product pretty readily. Uh, talking to a number of traders in the, in the feed wheat, they're saying it's very hard to buy at the moment. They're aware there's wheat there. Um, growers are looking probably more to the spring for free grain opportunities, thinking there's going to be good demand there. So, so that's good, but be aware currently perhaps there's not a lot selling, so do keep a close eye on it. Um, there will certainly be demand in spring, but we don't know just exactly what product could be there. One of the ones that could have a bit of effect uh, potentially is maybe 30 odd thousand tonne of wheat should have been destined for milling. It could also enter uh, that feed grain 
category. It maybe softened a wee bit by the fact that yields were back a wee bit too. Um, I guess touching on contract opportunities, I've sort of covered this a wee bit. Uh, the mills have told me they hope to be out very soon. We've pushed and encouraged them to at least get a newsletter out as soon as possible, some indication around varieties that they may be seeking or anything. If they have got a good supply of a particular product, let us know if that's not going to be what they're looking for. Um, we haven't seen as yet. I'm hoping it will be soon. Uh, all mills will be out buying. Um, and, and Colin touched a wee bit on the uh, anti-competitive nature of seed. I hope this is as a result, but I have talked with Maori Mills. They have indicated to me they will be buying grain again directly, um, either direct with growers, if you so wish, or through some merchants. They said they don't think they'll be going to all merchants, but they will have some they're going to, and I don't know which ones are or aren't, other than probably the big players, particularly in the breeding programs, will be included in there. So, so keep an open dialogue with your reps. Uh, there are opportunities coming there. Wilmar Trading will still be purchased for there as well, if, if that's an avenue you, you wish to take. And um, the other mills will be purchasing also. So opportunities should be there. Outlook, we've seen and heard a lot of the free pricing. They are very strong and positive. Uh, again, as I said, know your values and see for your own businesses whether those fit that. Um, opportunity to make decisions early and, and take up some of those opportunities uh, certainly will be there and I would hope reasonably soon. So uh, yeah, with that, I think that sort of covers the subjects I want and probably hand it over to Ivan now. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, I've been, uh, thank you for inviting me along tonight. Um, I just wanted to put a bit of a positive spin on all of this and say that uh, out of crisis and out of the horrible harvest we have, we also have opportunities and that the opportunities that were there uh, probably two years ago before COVID uh, and the crisis, international crisis that we've been um, fronting up to, um, the opportunities are still there and they've actually improved in certain ways for us. And, and I guess the art will be in how we can take advantage of those market conditions um, that we can use. And I think absolutely agree that one of the first things we must do is to uh, understand our own costs, have a very clear picture of what product we have to sell and what are the advantages of that product. So I'll start off by giving you a bit of a sneak preview. Um, for those who don't know AFIC, uh, AFIC is the Arable Food Industry Council, and it's an organization that brings along uh, just about every uh, different organization that's in the arable food value chain. And every three years, we commission a rather expensive report put together by um, some reputable um, uh, economic analysts in Wellington, bringing together those facts and figures from, from arable uh, all together. And the value of this is that we actually can use this when we're explaining to government or we're explaining to industry uh, what arable is about and, uh, and what we can actually bring to New Zealand agriculture. So I thought I'd give you a bit of a sneak preview because as we're putting together these figures for 2021, uh, we're actually comparing to the last report, which was done in 2018. And um, whilst these figures might be pre previous to this harvest and might not reflect what happened in this actual harvest, it still does uh, manage to put forward a trend around the value of our industry, uh, not just the volumes. And so just for, a, for an example, I'm looking at, at the herbage and vegetable seed sector, uh, of which I'm partly responsible for with CERC and so forth. Uh, we've had a growth in value of 30% between 2018 and 2021. So those figures are pointing really in the right direction. When we look at cereals, uh, both categories of milling wheat, feed wheat, and then feed barley and malting barley, um, that value figure combined is actually in the vicinity of 40% between 2018 and 2021. So whilst... Um, Brian was referring to, yes, we do have increased in inputs costs. We have increases in fuel. We've got increase in compliance costs. 
and understanding those costs are really important. Uh, it's actually positive to look at the bigger picture and see that the industry as a whole is growing in value. So I just wanted to give that as a bit of a positive spin uh, and also understand that in a situation where those growing costs of inputs uh, like fertilizers and chemicals are putting pressure on the system, there might be also value to be gleaned from the reduction of inputs and selling that good story around reduced inputs in our crops. So I'm just putting that out there as an opportunity. It may not apply to everybody and it may not apply to everybody's system. Next to that, uh, I just wanted to give a bit of an update on what's happening, happening with the milling wheat in particular, the milling wheat initiative, which we began uh, again back in 2019, 2020. Uh, then, you know, situation changed with COVID, but um, the whole initiative is still going ahead. It's a positive view, despite the changes we've had in the milling industry and ownership, and despite of the situation of the harvest, uh, the upward trend. Uh, and the demand for milling grains internationally puts a, puts a positive incentive on our prices uh, and our ability to go forward. But I just wanted to mention that today, I had a bit of a preview of the results of a survey that we've just done in February on bread consumers in New Zealand versus a, uh, exactly the same survey done pre-COVID. And the figures, the initial figures that are coming that, and we haven't done the full analysis, is that we've probably increased uh, the overall appetite of the consumer uh, in about an extra 20 cents per loaf of bread if they could understand and clearly see that the origin of that bread was from New Zealand grains. Uh, so that's up significantly from our previous survey. We've actually got uh, fifty-two percent of surveyed today saying they would pay fifty-five cents more per loaf of bread if, if they knew it was New Zealand origin, and uh, thirty percent more, uh, thirty percent of uh, consumers saying they would pay fifty to six, uh, fifty-five to sixty cents more for a loaf of bread. So all those trends are on the up, and uh, in some ways helped by COVID, and also helped by their awareness of what's happening internationally and the Ukraine situation. Um, in terms of news on new crops and new products, um, probably the far focus has been on the last uh, couple of years uh, on the development of two particular niche crops or regional crops, uh, one of them on the higher lake sunflower front. Um, again, uh, we started back in 2017, 2018 harvest, uh, doing a trial uh, with the industry uh, of about 20 hectares throughout Canterbury. Uh, in the last season, we grew 500 hectares of that. And conversations with uh, New Zealand Pure Oil uh, just yesterday are indicating that our prices for this coming season might look in the vicinity of maybe 40% increases on last year. So it's an incentive to grow another new crop and present a crop option. Um, more recently, uh, last week, we've just wrapped up the Durham Wheat Initiative project with um, a funding from MPI and a group of wire wrapper growers who are looking at uh, uh, a regional flavor on a, on, a, on a very specific crop like Durham Wheat for pasta. And that's, um, that's just finished now. Uh, for those who don't know, last year, just through serendipity, Canada had an appalling harvest of Durham wheat. They are the major Durham wheat producer in the world and major exporter. And uh, the price of Durham wheat on the international uh, front doubled from about $400 to up to $750, $780. So uh, this was uh, uh, previous to the Ukraine situation arising. Uh, it had already put a very positive spin on the market. Uh, and that's one more indicator that New Zealand does have uh, some opportunities here uh, when uh, international situations get complicated. So we really want to um, encourage people to understand what product they have, the quality of the product they have when they go and negotiate, and understand the costs of those products. And also understand that there's money to be made outside the farm gate, 
And as we've seen in this project and, uh, and the growers have understood very quickly, uh, yes, there's a, there's a significant profit to be made if you can capture it outside the gate. There's a hell of a lot of work to be put into promotion, production and distribution of those products that we also need to understand the date, time and effort. So for me, um, I'll hand back to Nick at this stage. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ivan. Um, now it's time for the Q&A session where things get interesting. Um, so we've got a couple of questions already appeared up on the Q&A. Um, so thank you for that and keep them coming. First question from Peter, the current price of wheat and barley on the free market, what is milling wheat going to get to? And what impact will there be of the shortage of milling wheat? I uh, might put that question to Brian perhaps in, in the first instance. Thanks, Nick. Um, look, to try and put a number on the wheat price is very difficult. Uh, I guess we've seen at times when Ukraine and Russia go into peace talks, we see the world price drop, and when the peace talks fail, the world price goes up. So uh, certainly that is having a major effect on commodity prices in general, and wheat's no exception. Um, the mills are becoming much more accepting of paying the 600 plus price um, on free wheat, whether they are ready to go to that position on contracts yet, I'm not just sure, but the conversations I've had, certainly uh, it's not foreign language to them now. Um, sorry, Nick, what was the other part of the question? Uh, what would be the impact of the shortage of milling wheat? And presumably that's um, in New Zealand as a result of the harvest. Yep, so um, talking to the mills, they do believe quality product is available out of, Christ out of Australia still. Uh, although they've got to compete heavily and it will potentially still drive price more. Uh, and because of the, perhaps the COVID thing, the logistics around the timing of delivery is certainly challenging for them. And it does support uh, the desirability for domestic grain. There is no doubt about that. And therefore, that potentially supports uh, solid prices on it. Um, I guess I'm not one, I'm not to predict prices as, as John touched on, it's not our job, I guess, to predict prices, but we hear regular stories of round grain prices where they sell on the free market. This week's been much more settled last week. It moved from about 600 to 650 for premium wheat quite quickly. Um, I haven't heard anything above that and that will be delivered to mills. That was free wheat for reasonably prompt delivery. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, another question here from Sonia. Um, I think this might be another one for Brian, or, or uh, and again, I'm happy to take another person if that's better. Um, who do we send wheat to to be tested? Yeah, look, I, I will start there. There is one or two independents. Uh, B. McCloy's, I think, set up to do it. The reality is, um, if you can get a test done and know your product, before you offer up to a mill, if it's in a free uh, state, that's good. I think also Wilson's, there are one at Wilson's Transport, have a testing lab, there's a few about, uh, that will give you an active position. The reality is the mills will test it themselves, and I believe they'll give you an upfront and honest result. I don't think you need to mistrust that. One thing probably I didn't say, uh, do or repeat rather, just do get contractor grain test res tested as promptly as you can, because, there is a wee bit of fear that you're showing your hand, but the reality is it is contract. The mills need to know the quality if it's going to grade or whether they're left short. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, another question from Malcolm, and this might be another one for Brian, but we can open it up to the others too if they, if they have an opinion on this. Um, so any idea what import parity is on milling wheat currently? Colin, have you... Got a hand on that, or Ivan? No, uh, I, I don't know. Sorry. I, I personally think we're in an extremely volatile situation. Hence, uh, we don't have a an open New Zealand milling wheat market. Uh, the market, the parity uh, today would be whatever you're quoting it. Uh, Port Australia through, um, we get the regular bulletin from um, 
from NZX. Uh, uh, it, uh, it isn't updated daily. Uh, we do know that we've had a significant drop in the last week in the price of international milling wheat, and that's probably driven by the fact that uh, I guess the, the best indication of what that drop might be is probably driven by the fact that Russia has seemed to have lost a bit of steam in its uh, advance in, a, in the Ukraine and that they might just be looking at staying in the eastern side of that country and that e once that process is over, uh, tensions might ease and that then um, the rest of the crop through Ukraine might be more normalized. So there's always a correction in the markets. So I think the spike that we saw uh, 10 days ago dropped significantly. And that's just market correction. Um, to give you an, 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 an idea, I think we would steer you wrong uh, at this stage if we gave uh, an indication of what we thought that price parity might be, because we don't know what demands Australia has from other markets at the moment in terms of where they're, where they're trying to place their grain. Um, the best we can hope for, again, as I say, is look at your own sums, where have you come from and your costs, and when you find a point of sale that suits your business uh, and has made you a, a, a satisfying profit, that's where I think you should be. I think we've got a danger about over-speculating this. Um, as I say, if tomorrow morning, uh, Mr. Putin and Mr. Zelensky decide to sit down and have a cup of tea, uh, and all of a sudden things would, by some miracle, calm down, the price of wheat internationally could drop up to 100 US dollars overnight. So we've got to be very careful that we don't over uh, get over uh, ambitious about what that price point might look like. Thank, thank you, Ivan. Um, a question that's kind of related to this. Um, can we grow all of New Zealand's milling wheat requirements? And if so, should we? So maybe maybe perhaps Brian or, um, or Colin, or we'll look at any of the panel members who have an opinion. It would be, it'd be an interesting question. Well, the first answer, I guess, is yes because we currently by tonnage do, but we would rob the feed industry blind to do that. So we do need more growing area and there is quite a bit more that we could grow uh, in areas Southland, there's areas in the North Island, potentially more in Canterbury, particularly if, if returns are up a bit. So um, to get to total uh, production of New Zealand's requirement is not an overnight thing, but certainly we can move towards it. New Zealand did used to grow all its own wheat. Uh, admittedly, we've got a bigger population now, but uh, yeah, we can increase a lot, but we do want to still protect and maintain a strong feed industry as well. So that could be a hindrance. Great. Anyone else have an opinion on that question? Yeah, I'll have a crack there too. Look, look it's something that I'm interested in. I certainly had a bit of publicity about, you know, especially when, you know, for goodness sake, wheat might not, we not might, even better secure wheat, imported wheat. So it is an opportunity for us to grow more milling wheat and that's part of the strategy we've been working on to grow more or potentially grow all of New Zealand's wheat. But I think Brian said we will um, miss out on other crops. But anyway, competition is really good. And um, yeah, so hopefully, uh, yeah, and we have had some initial discussions with MPI about this. Um, they're really interested. And uh, that was just last Friday. And we're gonna come back and have another discussion with them in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, so who knows? Yeah. I think it's, it's moving the grain to the North Island is the problem. Um, yeah, and there is initiatives going on there with um, uh, some of the transportation um, with containers and whatnot with Kiwi Rail and a bit of a bit of government money um, into Wearings in, um, in Ashburton. So look forward to how that might come off. I think um, to add to, to Colin's comment, I think that there are opportunities uh, for growing milling wheat in areas where we haven't traditionally grown it and, and we can do it successfully. There's also an opportunity, well, certainly in the North Island, there are areas that can grow uh, good quality milling wheat and, and we've been doing some trialing work over there and we know that that's possible. There's also the opportunity to grow milling wheat or on livestock uh, farms that weren't traditionally arable farms. And um, there is demand 
from the livestock sector to get their act together with, um, with their environmental footprint. And that might open opportunities for either arable farmers moving on to livestock farms and growing crops on neighbor's farm, or those neighbors actually um, engaging in becoming arable farmers to a small extent themselves. So that's another growth area potentially. Yeah, I think Nick, just the, um, as Colin said, I think if we did do it, it would be at the expense of other crops. But as we all know, wheat is a, is a basis by which a lot of pricing is based off. So you know, if we are able to hold that milling price of wheat up, then it does have a flow on effect to all the other crops we have in, in the pricing of those crops as well. Thank you, David. Oh, John, do you have anything to add for that, John? Well, as soon as I unmute myself, you know, I was just going to actually say what David just said. Uh, things that I, I can see is getting the getting the product from the South Island to the North Island, because obviously the majority is grown in the South Island, the majority is consumed in the North Island. There's projects underway there, so that's a good news thing. Um, displacing other high value crops and, and, and not just feed wheat, but also um, brassica crops and various other things that we do. We've got a fantastic resource in terms of the land, but it is finite. Um, and the third comment, it might be a little bit controversial, but I would just say that perhaps 100% of anything isn't necessarily the economic optimum. Um, Australia is very good at, at growing um, bread wheat. However, economic optimum may not be the key driver when you see how quickly the world can change with what's happened in the Ukraine and, and we're really talking about food. So, yes. Uh, I think we should be trying to grow more. Whether or not we'll ever get to 100%, I'm not sure that's actually the key issue, but we certainly can grow more. Great, thanks guys. Um, another question I think which we could all, um, which I'll pose to you all, um, and I guess it's another one of those crystal ball ones. Where do you see input costs tracking over the next year? For example, what might happen if urea went to $2,000 per tonne? Who wants to have the first go at that? Well, uh, that's the question I posed, I suppose, and I just a, a wee bit flippant, but it's, it's like when costs go up, we put less on, so yields will drop, I suppose. That that was the, the main point of that. But, you know, we all know what's happened to urea, and, you know, the, the international price was peaked in November. It dropped down to 700 US. It's, peak, it's at a higher peak at the moment, like it's about 950 US a tonne for urea, and we all know what's hap happening to shipping. So... You know, it, we're still up for a big rise for the spring, I'd suggest. Um, it depends on what, you know, and we're really lucky to have two good, strong cooperatives in our fertiliser companies, but, you know, they still have to meet world price at the end of the day. It depends how smart they are with their shipping and, and forward exchange and all that sort of stuff. So it, it will have a big impact for this coming season. Cool. Anyone else like to have a go at that? Well, again... It's based on the opportunities and, and the new ways that we could market things. Uh, one of the things that came out from the recent survey on milling wheat is the increased appetite. And, and we can discuss with the bakers around understanding the extra cost when you have depressed yields for, low, for lowering your inputs. But there's certainly a very clear trend in demand for lower input wheats, and that might be either lower uh, spray-free or reduced spray opportunities, reduced use of, 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 of synthetic fertilizers, all opportunities that we need to market and drive as, hey, we can show you the traceability of this product because it's New Zealand grown and we know exactly what's being put on it and this is the product we're selling you. So in the face of increasing fertilizer costs, maybe we can drop those inputs slightly, accepting that we're gonna have a yield penalty, but that we can still deliver a premium product that will appeal to the consumer. Right. Anyone else want to have a go? I, I, I'd, just, I'd just say one thing that with all the input costs we have, we're in a true global community now. And what's happening in New Zealand is happening everywhere else with all our competitors who we compete against in producing these products. So. Um, you know, we are in essentially one market as a global market now, whereas previously we weren't, that wasn't necessarily the case. So, you know, while it might be costing us, it's also costing our 
the people that we're competing against. Um, so that's, I guess, that's one thing that's to be mindful of that, you know, we're all on this together, not just as a country or not just as New Zealand farmers, but as global farmers. Cool. Thanks, David. Um, move to the next question. We've actually got a few backed up, so, so that's cool. Um, question from um, Doug. The consumer is prepared to pay an extra 50 to 60 cents per loaf. How can the grower capture a percentage of that and not lose it all further down the chain? So I think that was in relation to Ivan's um, comment about the recent, about the research that had been done. So much has been said about this value chain and who's making the money along the way. Um, some of the learnings we've had in this mini project around the Durham wheat, which is a specific niche product and in, and in a specific region, is that you can actually start looking at different ways in which you commercialize your product. So the traditional and conventional way that we have thought about selling our wheat, which is a forward contract with a mill, uh, we don't know what's going to happen next year, but the price kind of looks all right. We'll sign that contract and hope for the best uh, that we'll get a yield and deliver that to the mill next year. Might actually have a reverse process in which we start thinking about, okay, can we take some risk either on our own or with a group of growers where we actually own the wheat? We told process with a processor or a milling, wheat, milling company that's milling, willing to partner with us, and then start to market that end product in a completely different way where we're actually having a provenance, known provenance of the product, uh, known inputs, and market that directly to bakers in a, in a slightly different way. So that, that's, that's option one. Um, I think in, in Option two is one where we're actually partnering with millers and distributors along the way. And though we might be actually selling the product, we're actually incentivizing uh, the, the total end price of the product at the supermarket or retail in which everybody in that chain takes a slice of those 50, 60 cents. But if at the end of the chain, the grower can take 20 cents, well, that's 20 cents we didn't have before. So of the 60 cents we've captured one third, it's actually really good. It would be ideal if we could capture more of those 50 cents. But, but there, are, there are several mechanisms and the, the learnings of this current mini pilot plan, if you like, is that uh, those 60 cents can really be achieved if you're, if you're willing to put the hard yards into, into the extra work that means marketing your product once it leaves the farm gate. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, unless anyone else wants to have a crack at that, I might move on to the next question, which is um, an interesting one given um, what we talked about, just what Colin referred to in the North Island. Um, and this is from Jim, who I believe is from the North Island. What opportunities are there in the North Island? Maybe that's to do with crops um, or you know, areas where wheat could be grown, perhaps. I think it's quite a quite a good opportunity for the North Island when we when we look at the isolation issues we have in Canterbury, um, the amount of grass that's grown in Canterbury, um, we are we are physically running out of arable ground in Canterbury to grow these crops, which is why contracts aren't being fully fulfilled. Um, so there are opportunities in the North Island. I think one of the biggest challenges we've got there is the infrastructure to to process and handle the crop post harvest. Um, that's probably what's holding it back. But, you know, the, the contracts and the crops are there to be grown. Um, it's just probably that infrastructure that's needed in the North Island for that to occur. Cool. One of the no. ones, that, sorry. Go, no, Brian. One of the ones that was touched on, I guess, is recognition of where the large population is from the milling wheat perspective, as opposed to where the bulk of the milling wheat currently is produced, the logistics and the cost of moving all the product to the North Island. So, so there are areas in the North Island that do have a considerably less freight cost in getting, getting to those mills. And so that potentially creates opportunity there as well, which works in, as we've touched on previously, around rotation on farm, that uh, some of the higher values in the, in the herbage production 
uh, does rely on cereal, but vice versa as well. Cereal uh, does work in well with these others in the, ro in the rotation. Yeah, yes, I'll just chip in here. Look, it certainly is, and that's going to be part of our discussions with the MPI. How, how can we attract more um, more types of crops, or especially milling wheat for for New Zealanders um, in in the North Island where the where the population is? And that it could be that um, sheep and beef farmers that have it part of their pasture renewal system, or even dairy farmers could have it part of their pasture renewal systems. Um, that was the old traditional way, the mixed mixed cropping type farms you know, with livestock, integrating livestock and, and cropping uh, used to work in the past. So I think that's the opportunity. It, yeah, it, it solves a lot of environmental issues as well. So look, a lot of the calls that, that I get uh, at FAR on a daily basis uh, are from people in the North Island who are not necessarily uh, that involved with crops or might grow a small amount of crops and looking for new opportunities. And there's questions around uh, soybean, crops, there's question about growing uh, other, other protein type crops to supply those big urban areas up there and opportunities that arise. Um, as recently as yesterday, I was having conversation around sunflower and whether with the increases in price, we can absorb some of that freight cost to come back down to Rolleston uh, and grow sunflower in the North Island, which actually has some very good conditions for growing summer crops. So I, I still think that there's a huge opportunity uh, untapped in the North Island. Uh, infrastructure, on-farm storage really are issues and also um, yeah, access to machinery, the right type of drills and the right type of combines. Right. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here, um, speaking of environment, but it might be related to the environment, it depends what you mean by sustainability. But Hamish has asked, is feds worried about the sustainability of the industry, uh, whether that means environmental or other forms of sustainability, not 100% sure, but I'll toss that one open and see what people think. Well, I might have a crack at that from the herbage seed point of view, because I think that's probably um, the area that's feeling the pain the most. Um, the contracts that we're working to now were first mooted back in November, and it's a very different world that we live in now with what's happened with inflation in the meantime. So a lot of those contracts are in place, either verbally or written, and that's locked this in to a relatively low level of profitability for the next 12 months. So I kind of think we've got a, a cost of living crisis in the arable industry, and um, that is not sustainable. With luck, it is sustainable for 12 months. I suspect we'll, we'll get through, but we, we do need a quantum shift in the way, uh, in the pricing, but also in the way that um, herbage seeds are valued. And what I would say is, if you look at the store lamb market, for example, the grower of those lambs gets a percentage of the value of the product in the end market. And to me, that's how it should work. In the um, forage market, in the, in the herbage market, it's the merchants who dictate what we're going to make because they say, well, the farmer wants a needs a gross margin of X, the crop will yield Y and therefore the price will be Z. And it has no direct correlation with the value of that product in the end market. I don't have any answers, but I think that's our major problem in the arable industry, particularly in, in the uh, herbage seed area. Until that changes, we're only ever going to get, we're locked into mediocrity. So in the short term, I don't think it's sustainable, but in the longer term, I think the merchants are open to negotiation. They understand that this is not sustainable. The conversations that I've had personally with some of the bigger companies, they are concerned. It's a mutual um, relationship, it's symbiotic. They need area, they need growers. They know that it has to be rewarding for growers and they are ready to listen. Right. Thanks, John. Um, does anyone just, else want to have a go uh, at that question? Yeah, I'd just like to back up comments. You did right, John, and I've had those same conversations with the the executives of those companies. Look, we, we've we've just sort of chugged along the last few years and the price has been pretty static. And when we have a really poor harvest like we've had, especially in mid-Canterbury, it's really compounded home here 
how that profit and loss um, balance sheets has been significantly affected. Um, yeah, look, we're really concerned about it and we're having those good, honest discussions. And I think the key with this, it's got to be an enduring solution and needs to, to go out forward for a number of years. And certainly, um, yeah, c come and talk to us if you've got any issues or, or any ideas. And um, we're really keen to um, try and, um, yeah, well, we've heard a bit more tonight about understanding your costs. It's those fixed costs that we need to really get a handle on. And I just back up John's comments. The seed companies do the gross margins. They work out sort of what we need to get as a return. Um, it doesn't necessarily reflect what they get out in the end, in the end market, I suppose. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else like to have a go at that question? I'd just back up and I think I'd say that, um, you know, financially we're not sustainable and we probably haven't been for a number of years now. Um, environmentally, I think as a sector, we're pretty good. Um, you know, I think we can actually hold our heads up pretty high as to what, the way in which we do operate um, environmentally. So, but yeah, the problem is the financial sustainability of it. And as Colin said, we need to find solutions that aren't just going to fix it for next year's crop. We need to find contract conditions and negotiations that make it viable for our contracts 10 years out. Um, and there might be some quite big shifts in the way in which we contract things potentially um, in order to achieve that. Great, thanks, Brian. I've got another uh, question. Oh, sorry, does someone else want I to- I was just gonna say on that one, um, on the grain one too, I guess we've survived on yields and, and the poor harvest does drill that home a bit, but grains is largely a commodity and what we're seeing globally, and, and David touched on this around the fertiliser price, but also uh, our counterparts overseas have probably got similar complaints to us around returns and large as well. And so globally, I think there does need to be a bit of a move and that will support helping our sustainability of it. Great, thanks. Um, it's kind of related to the previous question, um, or at least the answers to the previous question. A uh, question from Steve, question for the herbage seed guys around seed pricing. So one for David and John. Are we best to try and partner with the seed merchants and appeal to their sense of social responsibility? Or is there a way growers can cooperate to create a more genuine negotiation? I, I think it's both. Um, as John's just mentioned, I think that the seed merchants are aware of the unsustainability of farming at the moment, arable farming. So, um, I think we can appeal to their sense of social responsibility to, to make sure that we are a viable um, industry. Um, I made a comment a couple of days ago that, you know, we may be the last generation of arable farmers if things don't change. And that's, you know, there's, there's a potential for that to happen because, you know, if, if it's not viable, um, then, you know, why would you continue to do it? But I do also think that farmers cooperating together, um, it gives us a sense of power and ability to negotiate better conditions in those contracts. So if we can work out um, what are the common things we'd all like to see in contracts or areas of contracts that we think need to be changed, um, that would go a long way. And I also think that not just in New Zealand, you know, at the end of the day, there's us in Denmark and Oregon as far as herbage seed goes, and none of us as farmers are making any money. Um, so, and we, between us, we probably produce 80% of the world's herbage crops. So there is the ability to have better negotiations between us all so that we collectively um, can potentially have a, some big, big level discussions with seed companies to make sure that um, they do have growers into the future because um, you know, the, the growers over there are struggling with pricing just as we are as well. Um, yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, I think um, the situation we're in now is an opportunity and it's something that has been brewing for many years. It's not just that we've had a bad harvest and our contract prices are out of step with the input costs. We've been growing at $2, $2.50, um, $10 behind the retail price for some time. And that's been building and building and it's almost a flashpoint, but it, it's an opportunity because we have had some cut through with the merchants. And I think that this is something that we need to seize on, but we need to do it together in a coordinated and reasonable, logical way, um, probably through federated farmers. But 
so that we can sit down with the merchants and capitalize on this op opportunity instead of just accepting another 15 or 20 cents a kilogram on our, our grass seed contracts because that's not fixing the core problem. And the gains that we make, we have to make sure that we are able to hold on to. We don't want the fluctuations in, in pricing on the proprietaries that we see on the commons. The other quick comment I'd make is Nui is key and everyone can see that at the moment with the pricing that we're getting for Nui to give us the, the ability to have a genuine negotiation with our merchants. So we're very, very fortunate to have Nui so that we do have options. And that refers back to the, the other body of work where we're actively looking at whether it's possible to get ourselves another Nui. Because if you are going to negotiate, you have to be prepared to walk away. And we all need grass in our system. So it's, it's a pretty difficult situation we're in but as I say I think it's an opportunity and we're really working on it to try and capture that for the next few years if not generation. Right. Thanks John. One final question I know we're running a little bit past time but um, there's some really good questions amongst here so one final question from Malcolm interested in and this is one for Ivan so Ivan get ready um, interested in Ivan's opening comments about the positives in the industry are these around new crop types or about more taking advantage of the cereal pricing that currently exists? So over to you, Ivan. I guess to an extent, both. Um, primarily, I think it's about being innovative and the new crop types uh, because I think that's what's in it for the long run. The, the opportunity of taking advantage of a current cereal price uh, might be really good this year and then next year, uh, you know, I know already that based on the what's happening in the Ukraine, other grain producing countries are ramping up their areas because they could also see the immediate price advantage. Uh, the chances are that that uh, spike that we've seen this year is not going to it's not going to hold on forever things are going to normalize and they might be a slightly step up from where they were but they're not going to be uh, at the peak so I think that's that's uh, being a bit you know if, we, if we're just focusing on taking advantage of price that might be nearsighted what we do have to take advantage of is uh, provenance our good reputation for quality uh, the fact that we are responsible and sustainable growers, the fact that New Zealand pays its uh, wages uh, at a much higher rate than other countries do, and that we can put all that into a package that really appeals to the consumer. What we've noticed and what we've learned from this COVID experience uh, is that consumers are paying more attention to what's in the package and what's written on the label than they ever were before. And, and some of that's gonna stay on, that, that some of that will stick. Not everybody, some people will go back to their old habits, but I think some of that, we do have to capitalize on it. Um, but as I say, there are situations which we don't know um, that the, these high prices will be sustainable because new people will come on, new players will come on the market and be willing to supply at lower prices. So I think that's that's nearsighted. I'm, I'm certainly thinking that the positives should be about the opportunities of us either growing new crops or developing new products from those existing crops that we're already growing very well in New Zealand. Great, thank you, Ivan. Look, we'll, we'll have to wrap up the Q&A now, but um, we'll be, we've got the questions with there is there is one more question left, but I think we're out of time. But we are doing a, um, a um, sort of a, a question and answer thing, which we'll get out to people and we'll, we'll try and address that last question as well. So look, thank you pan panelists for your answers, really informative and thank you um, participants for your great questions. Um, we'll just look to wrap up now with some upcoming events. Um, so look, there's, um, the Eat New Zealand Grain. So maybe I'll ask um, Ivan to just uh, mention, talk about that briefly. Yeah, thanks. Um, it, that's, um, that's an event that FAR is hosting in association with Eat New Zealand. Uh, it's been postponed over the COVID time. We would have much rather had this uh, at an earlier time last year. We've, we've tried to uh, conduct a few online alternative events, but it's finally going live on May the 4th 
Uh, tickets are available online. And what we will have is the best and most important bakers in New Zealand and some international perspectives on local grain economies uh, all brought together uh, in a forum at Christchurch to discuss this more in close proximity between producers and, and end users. So I think that's quite exciting. Uh, and it, it's it's part of opening these new opportunities. Great, thank you. Thank you, Ivan. And then we've got the Arable Awards. Um, Colin, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, so we've got the Arable Awards uh, coming up. So this is uh, likely to be in early August. So we, we've been having these for a number of years and in conjunction with Federal um, and with United Wheat Growers, we're going to have a big launch. Um, I have a whole lot of a bigger event. So with a number of um, uh, a number of um, um, categories for 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 arable industry, it's all about promoting ourselves and not uh, like a bit of a skite about ourselves because we need to celebrate our successes. So it, that's what it's all about. So um, I'm on the working group. It likewise is Brian. Um, and yeah, and we've got the grain and seed trade involved. We've got far involved and in, in, in the federated farmers. So it's a uh, yeah, and we'll be looking for sponsors and all that sort of stuff. So we're just getting it all, all our ducks in a row. And um, yeah, hopefully within the next uh, few weeks, we'll have, we'll have um, announced um, what's going on there. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, um, yeah, Colin. Of course, the Federated Farmers Arable Industry Group, AGM, will be coming up soon too. Um, Colin, do you want to mention that too? Oh. Colin's been muted. I think we, I think we're done just about. Um, so look, I'd just like to say thank you to um, to everyone who's um, participated tonight, um, particularly the the people that have joined us as as, um, as um, people who have listened and um, and asked questions. And I'd really like to thank the panelists who are incredibly passionate about their industry and their um, and very knowledgeable. And, uh, and a great representatives of the arable industry and farming more generally as well. So um, thanks so much for joining us and we'll have a recording of this webinar up soon. And, um, and also I think some Q and A's. So we do, we do cover all the questions, not just the ones that we managed to get to tonight. So thank you everybody and good night. <laughs>